Thank you very much. I was asked today to speak on the theme of LGBT Muslim solidarity. In other words, about building solidarity between the Muslim community and the lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender community. Now, in many ways, some people may think this is an impossible task because traditionally, Islam has been very homophobic. And of course, many LGBT people fear negative reactions from Muslim people. But that's all based on generalization. Not all Muslim people are homophobic and not all LGBT people are anti-Islam. There are in this country LGBT Muslims. There are two organizations, Imam and Hadaya, who are organizations of LGBT Muslims. They reconcile their faith and their sexuality. They say there's no conflict between being a Muslim and being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. So today's conversation is about the specifics of LGBT Muslim solidarity, but it's also about how do we respond when there's a conflict between religion and human rights, between religion and the rights of other minority communities. How can we find a way of resolving that contradiction? So I want to start on this particular theme by making two very important distinctions. A distinction first between Islamic ideas and Muslim people. And secondly, between Islam and Islamism. Now, I think it's okay to be critical of Islam or Christianity or Judaism or conservatism or socialism. You can be critical of any idea. That's part of living in a free, open, democratic society. All ideas should be open to scrutiny, criticism, and challenge. But it's very, very wrong to be against Muslim people. So you can be critical of the idea, but you should never show disrespect or act in a discriminatory way toward people. So it's the distinction between the idea and the people. Many of you will know that Islamism is not the same as Islam. Islamism is a particular political ideology represented in extreme forms by Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. Islamism believes that religion should be the state, that religion should have state power and that all the laws in a country should be subject to religious law. In other words, they want to establish a theocratic clerical state. Like, for example, they have in Iran. All the laws in Iran are based upon a particular interpretation of Islam. Those interpretations are the law of the land. And they're not even Islam in general, they're a particular form of Islam. As you know, in Iran, Iran is a Shia Muslim state. And their state reflects the Shia interpretations of Islam. And so Sunni Muslims are shockingly persecuted in Iran, as are Sufi Muslims, Ahmadis, and other Islamic sects and variations. So, it's really important that we understand those distinctions so we don't generalize and so we don't label all Muslims as being this, that, or the other. Now, when it comes to the whole issue of homosexuality in Islam, it's very interesting the way in which, traditionally, Islamic scholars have had a very narrow and I think quite misleading interpretation of the Quran. If you ask most Muslim people, they will say, the Quran condemns homosexuality. 
just like the Bible does or the Torah does. But they're wrong. There are no explicit condemnations of homosexuality in the Quran. The Quran talks about condemning lewd behavior, which people interpret to mean homosexuality, but I would say lewd behavior is exposing yourself in public. But some people, most people, interpret it to mean homosexuality. At the best, there are very weak condemnations of homosexuality in the Quran. And the Quran certainly has no punishments for same-sex relations. There's nowhere in the Quran that says gay people should be punished. Yet, as you know, under Sharia law, a particular interpretation of Islam, it states that gay people should be put to death, that gay people should be executed. And that is the policy in 10 Muslim-majority states today. Iran, Saudi Arabia, Mauritania, Yemen, Sudan, and a few other places, they have the death penalty for homosexuality based on Sharia law. But those penalties are not found in the Quran. They are found in the Hadiths, which are the uh, recorded sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. But Muhammad was a man. Muhammad wasn't Allah, he wasn't God, he was a man. And all men are fallible, all men are imperfect. And that includes Muhammad as well. So he was the one who devised the punishments. He was the one who eventually, based on his interpretations, actioned the idea of punishment. But it's also very interesting that at the time when Muhammad was alive, he had surrounding him homosexual men. So there's a big contradiction between his social milieu and the people around him and what he eventually said about homosexuality. Now, there are some Muslims who believe that the Hadiths, the sayings of Muhammad, have no true standing in Islam. They say, as Muslims, we should follow the Quran alone. The Quran is the word of Allah. Everything else is man-made interpretation. So Sharia law, which has been devised by Islamic scholars and jurisprudence, has no validity because it's not in the Quran. And indeed, the Quran says very clearly, this book is the complete teachings and word of God. It requires no interpretation, no amendment, no addition. This is the complete and total word of God. So that would mean that all these other interpretations are anti quran They are against what the Quran itself has dictated. Allah has dictated that his word alone, recorded in the Quran, is the only valid word for Muslims to follow. So that is a big, big issue and it's a, a matter of ongoing debate. There are more and more Muslim scholars who are coming around to this kind of interpretation. But still, the most do not. You know, the majority do not accept that. They say the Hadiths and Sharia are an intrinsic part of Islam. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that homosexuality has actually been central to Islam, particularly in its golden age in the 13th century, uh, when people from Muslim countries led the world in art, literature, mathematics, and astronomy. In that era, homosexuality was an integral part of Muslim life and of Islam. Many of the great scholars, the poets, the writers, revered and venerated in Islam, were themselves homosexual. And this was pretty much known about at the time. And even today, if you go to Muslim-majority countries, you will find extraordinarily high levels of homosexuality particularly between men. 
I remember as a young man, I went to Morocco for a holiday uh, many, many years ago. And I was astonished, wherever I went, I had men trying to have sex with me. And they were devout Muslims. These are people who prayed five times a day. So there really is a big, big issue. Now, there was a recent poll in Pakistan. Google did a search and did a compilation. What were the most searched for items on Google in Pakistan? Gay sex was number three. This is a devoutly Muslim country where under the civil law, homosexuality carries a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. Incidentally, under a law that was imposed upon Pakistan when British colonizers took over, so it wasn't an authentic Pakistani law. And of course, there are in parts of Pakistan, in rural regions, where Sharia law holds sway, gay people can be put to death. Yet gay sex is the third biggest search for people in Pakistan. Um, I mentioned that about 10 Muslim-majority countries have the death penalty for same-sex relations. Um, in the United Nations, Muslim-majority states lead the battle against LGBT rights. So even when the United Nations has discussed and proposed uh, that countries should protect LGBT people against discrimination, hate crime and violence, the organization of the Islamic Conference, the coalition of Muslim countries, led the opposition to block that. They were not even prepared to discuss, let alone sign up to, a statement condemning violence and murder of LGBT people. Um, yet again, there are huge contradictions. Um, in Iran, you may recall that the former president, Ahmadinejad, once famously said, Iran has no homosexuals. You know, he was responding to criticisms of the execution of gay people in Iran. And he said, there are no homosexuals in Iran. Now, this created a huge furore, and lots of people in Iran said, you're talking nonsense. So, about a year or so later, the Iranian parliament wanted to do a survey about young people's attitudes, because there's a lot of discontent in Iran. People do not, many people do not like the Islamic State. It suppresses freedom of expression. It persecutes trade unionists and workers who are fighting for their rights. It persecutes minority nationalities like the Kurds, the Arabs, the Baluch, the Turkmen. So to try and deal with this simmering unrest amongst youth, the Iranian parliament did a survey, a survey of young people's attitudes on a range of social issues. And they decided to put in this question about homosexuality, thinking they'd be able to get the evidence that President Ahmadinejad was right, that in this wonderful Islamic state of Iran, there are no homosexuals. They did a survey, I think, I can't remember how many, but it was tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of high school and university students. And there were several questions around gay issues. And one of them was, have you ever had a same-sex relationship? They expected zero. Imagine their surprise when 17% of Iranian high school and university students said yes, they had had a same-sex relationship. And that's probably an underestimate because, of course, homosexuality carries a death sentence in Iran. So again, it shows there's a huge contradiction between what Iran professes and proclaims and the reality of lived lives. Now, here in this country, my Human Rights Foundation, the Peter Tatcher Foundation, we do lots of human rights work on a whole range of issues, one of which is LGBT rights. And we get frequent uh, complaints, frequent pleas of help from LGBT Muslims who've been kicked out of their homes by homophobic parents who've discovered they're gay, uh, who are physically beaten by their parents or their brothers when it's discovered they're gay. They come to us for help. 
And they always say things like, I need help, but so do other Muslim people in my community. We had a situation of a, a young mu Muslim woman a few years ago. She didn't want to wear the hijab, but her parents said she had to, and her community and mosque said she had to. And when she refused, she was beaten up. She was beaten up by her brothers and cousins and by a couple of other people from neighboring Muslim families. So she now wears the hijab to protect herself from violence, but she doesn't want to wear it. But she said to me, what are you doing about this? I have rights as a Muslim woman to not wear the hijab if I don't want to. Why aren't you and other human rights groups doing something about it? We had another complaint from a young Muslim man who lived in East London. And he told the story how he'd moved into his new flat with his partner, and within five days of moving in, neighbors, Muslim neighbors, who started to suspect they might be gay, came knocking at the door and demanded, are you gay? Are you sodomites? Are you perverts? Are you queers? Now, initially, they refused to answer because they feared violence. And eventually, that's exactly what happened. Bricks through the window, graffiti on the doors. Get out, you disgrace the Muslim religion. You're a shame to Islam. Get out of this community. Again, he came to us pleading for help. He was living in fear of his life. So we decided to set up an LGBT Muslim solidarity campaign to try and build bridges with the Muslim community to have a dialogue to challenge this discrimination and hatred coming from some Muslim people, not all, and to try and um, you know, build a coalition, if you like. Because although anti-Muslim prejudice and anti-LGBT prejudice are different, they both embody prejudice, hate, discrimination. So surely, if both the Muslim and LGBT communities are marginalized and victimized, surely we should try and sink our differences and work together. We're not the same, we're different. We may disagree, but let's work together to stop discrimination and hate crime. Let's live in a society where Muslim people and LGBT people do not live in fear of violent attack, do not live in fear of harassment and intimidation by neighbors. So we began this campaign uh, with an event in Whitechapel in East London. Uh, we decided to put up posters in the street, LGBT Muslim solidarity, fight all hate. LGBT and Muslims stand together against prejudice. We produced a leaflet setting out our ideas to try and encourage LGBT people to be more understanding of Muslim people and Muslim people to be more understanding of LGBT people. And we did this outside Whitechapel Station, which is not far from the big East London Mosque. We did it on a weekday and we began leafleting people and speaking to them in the street. We had a very interesting <laughs> and challenging response. Of the Muslim people who stopped and we talked to, I would say that about 20% were quite aggressively hostile. They said things like, you can't be Muslim and gay. Gay people should be put to death. Gays don't deserve rights. Get out of here. We don't want you in this community. 20%. There was another 20% who said things like, yeah, of course, gay people should have equal rights. I'm a Muslim, but I respect other people. Discrimination is wrong. One woman said, oh, if I had a gay son or daughter, I would love them. I wouldn't reject them. They're my children. So a mix of negative and positive. And then the other 60%, you couldn't make out what their opinion was. They, kept, they obviously kept it very quiet and to themselves. Now, on the one hand, that's depressing. <laughs> depressing to think that 
you couldn't ascertain 60% and that 20% were hostile. But I was quite gratified that 20% in this very strongly Muslim area, publicly in front of other Muslims passing by, were saying positive things. That they, as Muslim people, believe that discrimination was not an Islamic value. So that's how we began and how we've been doing this campaign for the last couple of years. The big problem is that the mainstream Muslim organizations are not willing to dialogue. So the Muslim Council of Britain is the largest, most representative organization of Muslim bodies in this country. I think there's about over 400 organizations affiliated, including mosques and community organizations. But they won't dialogue. They're not even willing to speak. We've asked the East London Mosque to host a public meeting where they can have their own Islamic scholars and they can present their point of view, but also have LGBT Muslim people speaking. But they won't do that. They're not prepared to even let LGBT Muslims speak in their mosque or their Muslim center, um, let alone offer any kind of support. So that's a real problem. But it hasn't always been negative because the Muslim Council of Britain was set up in the late 1990s. And initially it was very, very, very anti-gay. You know, this is extraordinary. This is an organization who is saying that LGBT people are wrong, immoral, sinful. The law should discriminate against them. Then in the next breath they were saying Muslim people are persecuted. We demand rights. Well, isn't it a contradiction if you demand rights for yourself, but you won't give them to others? So we tried a dialogue with the Muslim Council in Britain, but it didn't work. They wouldn't even answer our letters. I wrote to the General Secretary, Iqbal Sakrani. He wouldn't even reply to the letters. That's how disrespectful he was towards the LGBT community. Um, but eventually, after the Muslim Council of Britain spoke out alongside many Christian and Jewish organizations against gay equality, um, I decided to arrange for an invitation to a debate I was doing on a completely different subject to their young media affairs spokesperson, who was of a younger generation. I thought, well, he's the most likely person to be open-minded. So we did our debate. I can't even remember what it, was, what it was on, but after the debate, we had dinner afterwards, and over the dinner I said to him, look, there's a real credibility problem here. You're saying you want respect and equality for Muslim people, yet your organization is trying to deny that to LGBT people. The public see through that. You are fueling anti-Muslim prejudice by acting in this way. Also, you are betraying your own Muslim LGBT people. They're part of your community, they're part of your faith. You are turning your back on them and colluding with their oppression. So I said to him, look, I don't expect you to endorse homosexuality. I would love it if you could accept it, but I, I understand, according to your interpretation of the faith, you can't do that. But can you at least oppose discrimination and violence? You know, opposing discrimination and violence is not endorsing something. It's simply saying these people should be free to live without fear of bias, discrimination, and hate crime. So he eventually accepted that. And then he went back to the Muslim Council of Britain and had this huge, big internal debate. And then lo and behold, in 2007, when the new laws were going through Parliament to prohibit discrimination against LGBT people in the provision of goods and services, the Muslim Council of Britain issued a statement saying, we are not going to be part of the protest against this law. We don't want to support discrimination. So, wow, they'd taken the stand we'd been hoping for. And we praised them, we thanked them. But sadly, two years later, there was a change of the leadership. And the new leaders reverted to the old policy so that when same-sex marriage was going through Parliament in 2013, the Muslim Council of Britain came out again, supporting discrimination, opposing equality. So they went back on the agreement they'd previously made. And that's where they are still today. 
sadly. But we won't give up. We think it's really important to keep up the dialogue, challenge, and build alliances with those liberal Muslims who do exist. 10 or 20 years ago, the universal story of all young Muslims your own age was that if their parents found out, they'd be kicked out of home and probably get a good beating beforehand. Nowadays, that's quite rare. They may still be kicked out of home, but they're usually not beaten up. Uh, and even now, we find increasingly Muslim parents are accepting their LGBT sons and daughters. So a change is going on. And that's why I totally reject the politics of the far right, the EDL, the BNP, who make generalized attacks upon Muslim people. That is so wrong and so unfair. These are bigoted organizations who demonize Muslim people, who do not acknowledge the change that's going on and do not support those within the community who are open to sexual and gender diversity. Just the other night, I was at an event um, organized by British Muslims for Secular Democracy. This is a group of British Muslims who believe that Islam and human rights can be reconciled. They believe that you can have a faith and a belief in Islam, but also support democracy and human rights. And I spoke to many of the people there and some of them quite candidly admitted that in the old days, they were very, very anti-gay. But now they've changed. They've changed because they take the view that to be discriminatory, to be hateful towards other people is not consistent with the true love and compassion which is embodied in the Quran. So that's my message to all Muslim people and to allies and friends and the wider community. Don't presume that the traditional view is the right view. Recognize there are liberal progressive Muslims who are making this journey and changing. And above all, support LGBT Muslims who are some of the most vulnerable, marginalized people in our society today. If we all stand together, LGBT and Muslim, we will have a better chance of defeating prejudice, discrimination, and hate crime. We'll have a better chance of creating a kind, gentle society where we can all live together. Thank you.